anti-immigrant sentiments in the country. And authorities are now increasingly under fire for downplaying the race and religion factor in crimes. The notorious Oxford sex grooming ring case being one of the most recent examples. Artis Polly Boyko explains. Across the country, many have been shocked at the uncovered sexual exploitation rings, first in Rochdale, then Rotherham, Derby, and most recently in Oxford. Gangs of men lure vulnerable young girls, some as young as 10, with presents in order to gain their trust. Then they force them to take drugs, rape them, and finally they sell them off into prostitution. The reported gangs are made up of Muslim men. Their victims, young white girls. So is the government choosing to ignore obvious markers when it comes to these horrific crimes, race and religion? To talk about the issue, I'm joined by Sean Thomas. He's a writer and journalist. Sean, you've written about the case in Oxford. Is there an elephant in the room? Is the government choosing to shy away from making a connection between these men's religion and their white victims? Uh, I think unquestionably yes in the past. Um, there is some evidence that these crimes have been going on since the early 1990s, if not before. Um, uh, additionally, a, a Labour MP, Anne Cryer, raised the issue maybe 10 or 15 years ago. And of course, notoriously, the, uh, the head of the British National Party, a far-right politician, uh, raised it in, no two, in 2001 and in 2004. And when it was raised in 2004, it was a subject of a secret BBC documentary. And the reaction of the, uh, of the political and legal establishment to, to Nick Griffin, that far-right politician, raising the issue was to try and silence him, not to investigate the crimes. Uh, he, he obviously is regarded as being an ethnocentric, if not racist, politician. But but they but they ignored everything he said and, and instead tried to silence his point of view. And so the crimes went on for another five or six years at least before they originally before they became finally revealed in the last two to three years. You've also mentioned in your writing that it was a Muslim prosecutor driving the sentencing in the Oxford case. Do you think anybody who was non-Muslim feared being branded a racist if they looked too closely at the case? The fact that it took a Muslim prosecutor in the northwest of England to finally cut through them and say, yes, there is a problem here, shows that, that, that white prosecutors, white social workers, white legal officers and white politicians were very wary of addressing the issue because they are all terrified of being associated with the BNP, with the far right, of being seen as racist. It can, it can ruin careers if you get that label. And yet the government hasn't taken this up as an issue. Do you think it's too dangerous a can of worms to open? Yes, completely. And in fact, to be fair to the government and the police forces, they are now in fact tackling this crime pretty damn seriously. I, I was reading a report the other day which said there are now 54 ongoing investigations into, into separate Asian grooming gangs around the UK. But in itself, that, that is an astonishing figure. That's 54 gangs. And each of these gangs may have dozens or even hundreds of victims. So we are talking about possibly thousands and thousands of girls who've been abused, raped, and some even probably murdered in the last 20 years because this crime was ignored. I mean, it is very shocking. We have to accept that, yes, white people can also be victims of racial crimes, and I'd say these girls were such victims. Sean Thomas, many thanks for your comments. There you have it. The Muslim Council of Britain is going to dedicate their next meeting to talking about how they can stamp out such cases of abuse, but we're yet to hear anything from the government on the issue. Polly Boyko, RT. London. Well, let's discuss this now further with Andrew Norfolk, chief investigative uh, reporter with the Times of London, who's carried out a two-year investigation into the targeting, grooming, and sexual exploitation of teenage girls by gangs of men. Thank you very much, uh, sir, for joining us here on RT. So as we know, you worked extensively on this issue. Now, the question is, is there evidence of neglect on the part of authorities due to the racial or perhaps religious character of the crime? Uh, I, I think um, that, that conclusion is unavoidable. Um, uh, just to give you one example, um, in uh, the north of England, uh, we obtained over 200 confidential documents that, that showed uh, there was a 10-year history in one particular town of young girls typically aged between 11 and 14 years old being targeted and befriended and then uh, given alcohol, drugs and eventually being passed around uh, ever-increasing groups of men to be used for sex. Um, that was known about for 10 years by, by the police force concerned, by the local authority concerned, uh, and there was an abject failure to take the action that was needed to protect those children and to prosecute the offenders. So why uh, nobody reacted uh, in uh, you know, the appropriate way to this? I mean, why was it let go for so long? Uh, I think one of the 
fact is that you've already been very clearly discussing is, is there was a terror of treading into what was seen as a cultural minefield. Um, there was an additional problem in that, that some of these uh, agencies genuinely don't seem to have understood quite how serious uh, these crimes were. There was a, a sense that uh, girls were somehow consenting to their own abuse. Um, the, the reality was, was far, far worse. So, um, uh, what other things could be at play here when we talk about a rise in uh, uh, the number of crimes committed by members of the Muslim community? Well, the, the thing we, on the Times, have been arguing from the very first story we published about this more than two years ago was that here is, here is a crime pattern, a crime pattern that the authorities for at least 20 years have ignored. And if you're going to address this, you need to understand why it has happened. And there are issues there which, to this day, no, no research has been carried out to try to discover. For example, issues surrounding the age of consent. Um, in, the age, in this country, you have to be 16 before you can legally consent to have sex. In, in the communities from which the, the main offenders come from, in their home communities back in Pakistan, um, village tr tradition says that puberty is the age of consent, and uh, religious law, Sharia, also says puberty is the age at which a girl can be married. Now, the average age for puberty in this country is 11 years old. Well, we're uh, obviously, we... uh, Andrew, uh, we're obviously dealing here with a cross-cultural problem here, and what does it say, actually, the situation, I mean, uh, that it led to, uh, what does it say about the authorities' effort to integrate those communities? Obviously, not well, enough has been done. No, the, uh, uh, multiculturalism is a very thorny issue in this country. The idea that you should allow different communities to, to develop separately and to continue with traditions which are... Um, which make them feel more comfortable with their life uh, in a country where those traditions are completely alien. Now, 